about Roberto. Um, and it's just so wonderful to see you all here. People from all the different facets of Robert's life over the years. It's so inspiring. Give yourself a hand. Thank you. So we invite you to come up here and tell us anything, any little anecdote, anything that you found interesting, special, funny, um, odd, whatever. <laughs> Robert lived a, a multifaceted life, as we all know, and I only knew him for the last 20 years, and many of you knew him way before that. So we welcome many of those stories, of the stories later on, whenever. So who would like to begin? I want to tell my little story. Okay, come on up. Okay, you want me to take this? Right <laughs> Hi, I'm Lynn, and I met Bob, I don't know, he was in his 30s, and I was probably in my 30s, and there was a group of us here who were playing volleyball at Riverside Park, and Bob came and joined us, and we just stuck together as a team and had great fun, but that's how I met Bob, but as you all know, Bob was so generous with his time. There was a period when I needed to go to my family house where I grew up on, in the south side of Milwaukee. And my dad was sort of conservative. And Bob and I came up the walk, and my father looked at Bob, and he looked at that beard, and he said, what is that? And, Bob, not missing one beat, said, well, who do you think poses for the Jesus Holy Cup? <laughs> <laughs> so, that's our Bob. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> okay, who's next? So, uh, I, oh, I'm Diane, Diane Paltzka, my younger Nosek, when I met Bob. Can you hear me? No. I can hear myself. <laughs> okay, so I've known Bob since I was in my 30s, and I was a divorced woman with four children, and Robert was my boyfriend. So, it was a, uh, oh, okay, so. Then it's not going to blow you away. Is this better? <laughs> I missed the story that we had yesterday. Okay, so Robert and I um, got together because I was going to home births with uh, Cindy Oblitz and um, Jenny Belch and Diana Krause, and it was through the midwives that I met Robert. And it was through Robert that I met the rest of them. Uh, Margaret Brill and I were treated to a trip. He paid for airline tickets. He took us to Arizona, and then we hung out there with uh, Maria and uh, with Bob's brother. And so Robert and his brother and I rode from Phoenix to the Indian Reservation, to the Navajo Reservation, and went I took the Jeep tour in Canyon Duché, and I just was blown away by that energy there. And I said out loud, oh God, I wish I lived here. And then eight months later, I was living there. <laughs> so that's all because I met Bob, because I knew Cindy. So, so we've been friends. Uh, I can depend on Robert, and he could depend on me. And the, the leaving with a light note Robert is always a hippie, kind of plain guy, and he noticed my bright red toenails, and he looked at me, and I said, oh, a little bit of Marilyn Monroe, and he said, keep it a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> the story that's haunting me, and then this is the end of my story, is 
that I heard Robert say several times that he wanted to come back as Dale and my dog. <laughs> and we're dog sitters right now, and we're just dogs coming and going, and that will forever be on my mind. <laughs> I'll pick the person that will be next. Me? I don't know if I have a good story. Hi, my name is Frank. Um, I knew Robert quite a number of years ago, probably 20 years ago, as the uh, canoe camping leader. And so my family and young children at that time were always invited on, on the canoe trips and we did a number of them over a few years um, and really enjoyed spending time with Bob. He was the master of wood gathering and burning and uh, you know, had a great understanding of the natural world and relayed that to all of the group. Um, had really seen or talked to Bob in the last probably year or two, so I kind of missed out on, on that part of his life, but uh, hope to see him on the other side. Okay, come on up.
uh, I forget what you call it, the knee bone. And so I have this, uh, now we're all fossils, but I have, <laughs> I have this one from Bob. So he was a very special person, and he still is to all of us. So Barbara was a lucky woman to have him for so many years. They were a team for sure. Moral support, they were each other's Whatever, you know. <laughs> All right, so who's some other person? Georgia, come say something of your brother. No? Huh? Oh, hey, there's some wild stories in this place. <laughs> Hi, my name is Joe, and I've been a friend of the Ivanses for my whole life. Bob and I were two days apart in age, and, and we went to the same high school, and um, there are nine kids in the family that lived in uh, 2032 North Cambridge, and there were kids running around the house all the time, and the dad, Roy Ivans, uh, he, was, uh, he worked at the museum in the history department. And, the whole downstairs was all bookshelves. All of the walls were bookshelves except for the kitchen. And uh, in, the, in the entrance was a piano there, and, and uh, George could play the piano real well. She knew all kinds of music. And we were always real noisy, and we had radios on. And Bob's dad was sitting in the middle of a room with a, with a wooden floor and a hardback chair reading a book. And we were all charging around, making all this racket. He never seemed to know. And uh, he was a real good father. But uh, I wish Bob could have been a father because he was like his dad. So thank you. OK. Family members? Any family members? James, where are you? You said you would. Come on up here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Bob's brother James, and um, I was telling Barbara about my faith and birth order. Um, Bob was the fifth child. The first five children came in six years. And then there was a four and a half year hiatus. And uh, um, so Bob, for four and a half years, was the baby in the family. And uh, I think you can get the point. He was really spoiled. <laughs> and he loved to just have fun, you know. And I don't blame him. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the older ones, we were... Um, my father was very Victorian, and uh, it was all utilitarianism and uh, in the industry, you know, and he kept us working and whatnot. Um, but Bob was the baby, and uh, he worked along with us, but he knew how to get out of things, too. <laughs> okay, so, and then followed my brother, Richard, um, four and a half years later, and three sisters, Shirley, Catherine, and Elizabeth. And that I always think of as family number two, <laughs> because we were way ahead of them in years. And uh, it's like, we didn't really get, we didn't do a lot of fighting with them because they were too small. <laughs> We just fought among ourselves. <laughs> but um, I think you can kind of get the picture of the family. Um, our mother was long suffering, you know, and, um, but she never gave up. And uh, we turned out pretty good. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have some more stories out there. I know there are. 
Come on, folks. Step right up. Yeah? Okay, come on up. Come on. Sarah, why don't you come up? Yeah, come on. Sarah worked for Robert in his shop. And this is Raphael. He's going to say if he works. Said, do you know how to use a computer? <laughs> I said, yeah. And then that was it. And that I think that shows what an open and curious and wonderful person he was. Just to, you know, there was a bunch of us who just seemed to wander in, and he he welcomed us in. And, and I I um, am so happy my husband got to know him, and they became really good friends too. And so we'll, he'll be dearly missed. Dick, you want to come up? This is another brother, Dick Ivins. Lots of stories. How close do I have to hold this? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, uh, this story takes place shortly after Bob and I both got out of the Army. I don't think we were out more than two years. I was going to night school to learn woodworking, seeing if I could get into that kind of trade. And uh, I had, was in the habit. I knew Bob, uh, he drank a lot in those days. And uh, he, he drank at, if you know the East Side, you might recall this. The uh, East Sider was on Farwell and Brady. And I, I would stop there after night school because I knew Bob would be there. So <laughs> it, was, it was his spot at the time. And uh, it was always fun to be with Bob. That's for sure. So as you're about to find out. Uh, so I stop at the East Side and sure enough, Bob's there. And there's a bunch of other people I know there. Uh, if you go way back with Bob, you might recommend, you might remember some of his names. Uh, Dave Searson. Is there, are there any real old-time East Side fans here? By any possibility? I wasn't a big drinker, okay? But I had a drink, and it was snowing. I, meant, I neglected to mention that it was snowing quite heavily at the time I walked in. So we were there maybe half an hour, and doing what people do at bars, talking, drinking, and in those days, smoking pot. Uh, so, somebody at the bar had this brilliant idea, and I think it was Bob, I'm pretty sure it was Bob. Bob says, why don't we all drive out to Kettle Marine? Because it's really, it's really beautiful to be in the forest when it's snowing. And we, were, we were all, I only had one drink, uh, I think, uh, but I had been smoking pot, 
uh, in the bar with other people. The East Sider was a pretty loose place. Uh, probably the uh, clientele would have rioted if they made a, a point about not smoking pot. So, believe it or not, about eight of us piled into two cars, and I was in Bob's car, which was a Plymouth Fury that he inherited from my brother who had moved to uh, Arizona recently. And so it's snowing quite heavily, and we're on I-94. We'll skip, we'll skip all the other nonsense that happened just to get in the car and get going and argue about where we were going. And you know how it is when everybody's loaded on pot. So we're on the freeway, and Bob says, okay, to the people in the other car, uh, you guys follow me, because I know the way, which he did. And uh, so we're out on the highway, and we're uh, somewhere around Lapin Peak, which is not too far from where we're going. And there's snow plows plowing in tandem in front of us, but they're only going 25 miles an hour, maybe. And Bob's getting really irritated about being behind these snow plows. So he starts, he says, he says, God damn it, I, I, we gotta get in front of these goddamn snow plows. <laughs> so Bob starts taking off. And I'm, I'm getting really scared at this point, because Bob's really plastered too. I, mean, I neglected to mention Bob had a long head start on me. I was in school learning, Bob was drinking. So, uh, we're on the uh, freeway and he's overtaking the snowplow. Well, guess what, the snowplow, as we get right to the snowplow, the windshield goes black. And we're really, we're all really freaked out. Bob's laughing like a hyena, I'm, I'm not exaggerating. He's just laughing, he's blasted, he's, had a, he's having a blast. And we get by the snow plow, the, man, the, the wipers manage to get it off, and we get out there, we finally, and the other car, believe it or not, they come right behind us. <laughs> and they make it through the snow plows, and we get out to Kettle Moraine, and of course the whole thing, the whole, the whole mood just changes. We get out of the car and it's just dead quiet. And to get into Kettle Moraine, it's, it's called the uh, Pinewoods Campground now. It had a different name at the time. And it's a really nice campground. And at that time, the trees were a lot smaller than they are now. And it's a beautiful place. So Bob knew the place. We, we had a connection with it from childhood. And I recognized exactly where we were. Bob pulls up. And lo and behold, the other car pulls up, and I think, wow, this is amazing. There's six inches of snow, and we're on this unimproved road, and we actually pull in here, and we're parked. Now we get out of the car, and uh, Bob had a girlfriend named Ruby at the time. She was with us in the car, and there was a woman who I didn't know, Ruby's friend, uh, and her name was Sandy. And <laughs> I'll need that later. <laughs> uh, so we're out of the car, and we get into the woods, which was the whole point of it, and sure enough, Bob was exactly correct in this. It's so quiet, and the snow is coming down, and I, it seemed like it was illuminated, but I don't think it could have been moonlight since it was snowing, but it was, it was very easy to get around, and we walked through the woods, and it was quite beautiful, and I thought, boy, it continued to snow the whole time we were there, and I thought, holy cow, we're never gonna get out of here. Uh, which, which we did, actually. So we were in the woods, and we had a really great time, and the woman named Sandy, I ended up actually living with for some time in the future. So uh, I always thank Bob for that, because I probably wouldn't have met Sandy at the time, and uh, Sandy had, uh, had had childhood as a, uh, she had had polio uh, in her childhood. And I had just met her and I had no idea. But when we were starting to walk through the snow, she was having all kinds of problems and I couldn't figure out, I thought, oh, man, she drunk. Wow. And then uh, Dave Searson, who was a really big guy who loved to beat the hell out of people, he sidles up to me and he says, he says, Dick, Dick. 
You know, she's got a, she's got a physical problem. And for Dave Sears, I'm gonna say that that's that's just remarkable <laughs> for him to talk so kindly about somebody else. And this is a this is a guy who would beat the hell out of you in a millisecond if he didn't like you. So so anyway, we started. Uh, that's how I met Sandy, and that was uh, that's that's the first part of the story. As I was telling you this story, there's actually a parallel to this story. Uh, and this one's going to go a lot quicker. And this one <laughs> involves Bob and Barbara and myself. And this happened within the last month. And it happened in exactly the same place. Now, in those many years since this original story happened, these trees have gotten a lot bigger. Well, Bob, in the last month, he wasn't capable of walking through the woods at all. So, Barb and I and Bob, we get Bob's electric cart, for lack of a better term, into the van, and we get Barb into the van, and Barb's wheelchair into the van, and we all head for this very same place, which is now 35, 40 years later, or maybe even more. And it's beautiful, but it's daytime, and it's a perfect day, and Bob is able to get around, so I'm helping Barb with the wheelchair, but she's mostly wheeling herself, and Bob takes off like a bat out of hell and loses us. <laughs> just like Bob. That's just like Bob. And he's rolling around in here. He's got the electric scooter. He's going up the hills. I'm pushing Barb up the hills. <laughs> so, to make a long story short, we had a really beautiful day. Luckily, I had just recently retired. I was able to, that's one of three or four really terrific days I spent with Bob in the last month. And Barb and I and Bob had a really, really good time that day. A really good time. And uh, what else can I say? That, that's the end. <laughs> one of my friends, but first I want to thank Bob for all his years of his patronage of coming to my place and, and uh, getting his hair cut and his beard trimmed. Thank you, Bob. He's always very generous with tips. But the, the story that I remember uh, concerns Bob and his brother, and I met Bob after his drinking days. I can't imagine what he must have been like. Uh, but this was back in the 70s, and he had been dating a friend of mine, Sue. And uh, it was during it was during the the time of, of the awareness of the feminist movement. And I think she was quite adamant about you know her her stand there. And Bob and I think Dick too. They had quite a sense of humor, and they had an old I think it was a Ford truck. I remember it was red, and it had no power steering. And it was a Herculean task just to try and turn that thing a centimeter. And he decided he was going to give it to Sue. And Sue was really happy about this gift. And I think it stalled somewhere in this intersection. She couldn't get the thing to move, and it, it was impossible to, to steer. And, and I think that was the last of the truck. You just kind of let it go. <laughs> but anyway, I think this was supposed to be a joke. I, do you remember that, Dick? He does. He, yeah, yeah. It was supposed to be a joke about, um, maybe you'd like to comment on that, I don't know, <laughs> about her stand and feminism. Could you steer the thing? No, could you steer it? Yeah. Yeah, wow, well, good for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot of work. I drove it to Minneapolis several times. Oh, I. <laughs> well, anyway, Bob, Bob was always a generous, uh, big hearted guy, and. Uh, we're gonna miss him. And uh, okay. thanks for having this. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Margaret? Margaret? Margaret. Yeah. 
Okay, oh, Matt's gonna tell a story for sure. You wonder why we're in this warehouse tonight? Well, Matt's about to tell you. What an introduction. <laughs> um, my name is Matt, and uh, I bought the business from Robert about five years ago. And, um, you know, there's like no crazy story or anything that goes along with it, really. It's just, I used to be a pilot, and I got tired of traveling. And I met Robert because I was buying and selling a lot of things. And uh, one day I came into his shop, and this is after I had known him for like six or so odd months. And he goes, you should buy this. Like he just looked, I'm like, I should, I should what? He goes, you should buy this business. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so, so uh, I was going to Afghanistan the next day because I was a contract pilot for the army at that point. And uh, the whole time I was there, I just, I kept, I was telling all my friends, I'm like, I don't know if he was serious. Like, I don't know what, I have no idea if this is real. So when I came back, um, I had emailed him a lot when I was there, because there was, at the major main base in Afghanistan, at the Bagram Airfield, they had uh, internet. And you could talk with people a little. So, um, when I got back, I'm like, okay, so how, how are we gonna do this, right? And he's like, just give me a little money now, and give me some later. <laughs> so, it, it literally was just a handshake deal, and then that was it. Um, and then, you know, over the course of the past five years, uh, I turned it into this with the help of Melissa back there, who's my girlfriend, but she may as well be my wife. We've been through things together. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, um, the, uh, Oh, yeah, no kidding, right? Thanks, Martin. <laughs> the bar's open all night, and it's great. Um, so, I, I still buy and sell a lot of things, but at some point over the last few years, I realized that I like to use the equipment more than sell it, and then that became the metal fabricating side of things. So, you know, and when I was with Robert, I would always ask if he was okay with that, because he was the one that started the company, and I wanted to make sure that, you know, he was all right with the fact that I was changing it so dramatically, because for him, it was such a social thing. And I mean, you want stories? God, I could go on for hours about people he knew and things, machines he broke. You know, like, there were, he had this pickup truck, I'll just say one quick. He had this green pickup truck that he just loved, and it just ran, it was such a piece of shit, like, and he's like, he's like, let's go pick up this thing I bought from uh, Peter Godfrey, you know, and uh, so we'd go over to his place, and it was on this really steep hill, so I'm like, Robert, we shouldn't load the machine here, and he's like, we're gonna do, you're gonna load that machine on this thing, and I'm like, all right, he's like, I know what I'm doing, I know what I'm doing, I'm like, all right. We started going up the hill and the whole truck went up in the air and the machine broke free and fell off the back. I didn't say another word. I was like, all right, let me go get the forklift and I'll clean this up. So, so but ever since that day, like, I, I gained a little respect there because I didn't question anything else. So, it kind of ties into where I'm going here. Um, so, when I told him I was changing the business uh, to this more than buying and selling, um, he's like, he's like, are you sure? I'm like, Robert, I know what I'm doing. He's like, are you sure? I'm like, Robert, I know what I'm doing. And, uh, you know, after he saw some of my finished work and got to go to some restaurants that I built out and things, uh, he really came to appreciate it. So, I mean, I owe so much to him because I would never be in this spot without him. I would have never had any opportunity like this and have met so many wonderful people like you and everybody else that was along the way and you know uh, I'd like to give special credit to Bill over there who's uh, was w working with Robert and uh, him and I man we, we've been through everything together and he still works with me now and he works just as hard as the day that we started and uh, Robert would always ask one of the first questions he would always ask no matter what 
health he was in was, oh, how's Bill holding up? And, uh, well, Bill's holding up fine. <laughs> so, you know, I just, I miss him a lot, and I'm disappointed that I, he wasn't able to see this become what it's about to, but, you know, I, I know he's here, and I'm happy about that, so. Anyways, that's about all I got to say, so. You want me to stay right here? I just want to make a little addition that maybe you can add to, because you were telling me about the last visit with Robert on Labor Day, and I wish you would tell that story real quick. Okay, so um, I was supposed to go to Dick's barbecue, but decided not to because I'm not like hugely social like he was, <laughs> which is fine. And uh, I went to go see Robert instead, and you know. He, passed away shortly thereafter. So everybody wants to know, like, well, what did you guys talk about? And what did you do? And did you say anything profound? Well, you know, we didn't. Like, we basically just watched TV and took naps. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It was just, it was nice just to be with him, you know? And I, I just, I liked his company. And uh, nothing special really happened, but I don't know, for me, it always was, you know? Just, we would tell stories and you know, he would tell me about the last time he bought a whatever and sold it for a million dollars and then lost it all on something and, you know, I just kind of miss him already. Oh, but, uh, you know, he, he was just, he was such a great guy and he was so, he was so giving and willing to uh, try anything and I mean, there were some things that I would buy and he would be like, Man, you know, he actually told me one day, this was like two years ago, and I, at this point, you figure at two years in, the company's still going, I'm not bankrupt, right? So like, I must be doing something right. He looks me right in the eye and goes, you know, you pissed a lot of money away on stuff that was junk. And I'm like, I did? I'm like, you should have seen some of the things you bought. So, you know. But again, I, I could just go on for days with the auction stories. I mean, goodness <laughs> sakes. And he knew all the auctioneers like by first names. So like we would have a special advantage. You know, like the item would almost be sold and then Robert would just look at the auctioneer and do one of these. He'd be like, and the auctioneer would be like, and sold. <laughs> I'm like, how do you do that? He's like, you just have to come to enough of them. And I'm like, okay. So. I still buy and sell, and I still go to auctions. Uh, and you know, everybody always asks, "Well, where's Bob? Where's Bob?" You know. So I'll just tell him that he's back at the shop. I don't know if I'll tell the truth. He'll just live forever for them. And that's that. They'll have to be all right with that. So I think I'm gonna end on that note. story because Matt became <clears throat> kind of like Robert's son he never had and it was a very special relationship we feel really proud of and that's why it was so wonderful to have this event in this shop because you can feel how much Robert loved this kind of environment you know kind of gritty and kind of messy and with all these machines that are so tempting to play with <laughs> so um, and it turned into such a beautiful occasion that so many of you were able to ride with and enjoy the, the roughness and the, the humanity of this environment. I'm going to pass you to Joan. Well, I just wanted to take this opportunity first to say to, hey, Matt, Matt, this, is, this would be not a bad place for a wedding reception. <laughs> There were quite a few pies, and so I know it wasn't a lot of people knew how much Robert loved pie. And, and not just pie, Robert loved good food. And he was fun to cook for because he was so appreciative. And you know, every time we would get done with get done with the meal, he'd say, no matter what, he'd say, 
that was dynamite. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Wasn't it? Yeah. That's it. <laughs> I've known Robert for more than half my life, but there are people in this room who have known him longer than that. But we were very close. <laughs> and we were very close, the three of us. My daughter coined um, the name Bob Robert. You saw that on the cake. She met him when he, she was not even two years old. <laughs> and um, I actually met Robert, but I just want to make it clear that I knew Barbara first. <laughs> I have to keep telling you that. Um, I met Robert through uh, Dale Carson. They worked together. They um, did carpentry. And Robert would come over in the morning and have breakfast and drink coffee. And actually, he didn't drink coffee. He just ate lots of breakfast. <laughs> and he was very appreciative of every meal that was given to him. And also very generous. I went out to eat with him, I can't, countless times. Countless, countless, countless times. Gosh, which story? There's so many, and we all have so many. <laughs> we all have so many. I spent a countless hours with him at Pine Woods. We walked around Pinewood so many times. We took so many hikes together. Boy, I just, I really miss him. And it's, it comes up every single day. Every single day I'm crying at some place in my life, wherever I am. Um, I'm so grateful that he was in my life and that we have touched each other's lives because of Robert. He started so many things for us. He started, I think, the canoeing. Or maybe that was Harvey. <laughs> I don't know. Lynn, you'd probably be able to say. Yeah. Yeah. Robert, he taught, you know. I, I bought a canoe from Robert so that I could go canoeing. He would come out to my house. I lived out in LaGrange, Wisconsin, out by the general store of LaGrange and the woodworks of LaGrange, and he would sell things that he auctioned on my front um, lawn. Cars, countless cars would pull up in my, on my lawn and buy stuff from him. It was, he was such a social person, always meeting people, always um, networking. He's a really, really special person and a really deep connection that I'll never, ever forget. Taylor. I'm fortunate enough to go 
back pretty far with Bob, uh, early to mid 70s thereabouts, the Milwaukee waterfront, Port of Milwaukee, Long Shore. Um, and then over decades and decades, lots of other adventures, mainly canoe trips, lots and lots of canoe trips. Uh, a number of us here tonight have shared those uh, wonderful adventures on the rivers. Um, Susan and I went to see Bob in the hospice just uh, a couple of nights before he moved on. And uh, that was two weeks ago today, as I, as I recall. And in fact, last weekend, just, just a week ago, a number of us were on the Kickapoo River, Wildcat Mountain, an annual adventure of, of many decades. Uh, and not too long before we saw Bob in hospice, he and, and Barbara were planning to make this, this trip. So it all kind of changed direction, you know, very, I'll say mercifully quickly in a way. Uh, but I want to acknowledge a great friend of Bob's who uh, I know many of you know, uh, Michael Oblitz, another one of our uh, canoeing buddies. And Michael and, and Bob uh, did lots of duo trips, from what I understand, and they were a tag team around the campfire with amazing uh, stories of uh, various river trips. Uh, the Hell Creek adventure comes to mind. Uh, it wasn't the name of the creek, but it was supposed to be this gentle little paddle that turned into the Hell Creek story. Wow. Uh, and I, I want to share with you something that I received just in the mail to a uh, Facebook message from Jacob Oblitz, who some of you know Jacob, I imagine. I hope so. Uh, one of the great people in my life, Michael's son, Jacob. Michael passed away quite some time ago, at least 15 years, I'm thinking, maybe more. And uh, Jacob and, and Bob kept a very, very close friendship over uh, all, all these years. Jacob's farm is up in Ashland area where he uh, logs with horses and does other really cool things, sugars, you know, and so forth. And he was down here to see Bob in those last couple of days at the hospice, but uh, wasn't able to come down uh, this evening. Uh, so he sent me something, it's actually quite a, a very, very touching uh, stream of consciousness acknowledgement of the, the very large role that that Bob has played in his life, Jacob's life, over all these years. Uh, and I'll, I'll just read the, the end here. Uh, it goes into some detail about Jacob doing ricing in the traditional Native American way on the nearby lake, uh, Chippewa Lake up there. And so he concludes, Jacob concludes this lengthy message by saying, tomorrow, or today, as you are gathering, I'll be out on the shore of Chippewa Lake processing my rice with the knowing that if Robert had not been in my life, I would be a lot less likely to be here doing as I am. And I think many of us can say something related that were it not for Bob's being in our lives, our lives would have been quite different. There'd be something missing. We might not know what was missing, but uh, that's surely my case. Uh, and uh, so I want to share a little uh, something I wrote after the canoeing and camping trip last weekend on, as I said before, the Kickapoo River and Wildcat Mountain. Uh, it was really kind of Bob Fest. All of us there were really tuned in and uh, uh, so day is done. Picture yourself part of a campfire circle. Sixteen folks relaxing and swapping stories after a day canoeing the ever-enchanting Kickapoo River in western Wisconsin, reminiscing in, uh, in particular about a mutual friend, Bob Ivins, who was part of many such journeys over many decades and had planned to be with us here on Wildcat Mountain before his long illness took a swift, lethal turn just days ago. I've camped here annually for 40-some years at a group site nestled in a grove of, ma of maples that create a remarkable green cathedral. 
a site within earshot of an adjoining double group occupied this weekend by a bunch of Boy Scouts, one of whom sounds forth with taps, which I've never heard here before tonight, probably never will again, but couldn't be more appropriate, as if on cue, as the campfire burns down to embers, the stories fade to silence. We grieve and celebrate Bob's extraordinary life and listen, amazed. Day is done, gone the sun, from the river, from the mountain, from the sky. Night has come, all is well, God is nigh. Bob.
sitting at the dining room table having dinner with his family, and they, something was falling from the ceiling, and they looked up, and a little mouse was looking through the hole, and he said, damn it, can you imagine that? That hole is still up there. <laughs> so, um, uh, in, the, in the last year, I know his, his life was really hard, and uh, he seemed to make as much as he could of it, and certainly gave a lot of joy to uh, to his family and his friends. And I know he had a wonderful, wonderful life with Barbara, and it was very, very deep and uh, very caring. And uh, I'll always remember him. He was very kind to our family um, during a, a big sale we had to try to send our daughter to a. Uh, camp for uh, talking with uh, um, augmentative communication, and um, he brought over a whole bunch of stuff that we got to sell at the at the sale. So it, it was a real benefit to our family too. So uh, just thinking about you, yeah, Robert, and uh, you're in our hearts today and always. Thank you. Anybody else? Come on, Justin. I was hoping you would come up. It takes like half the night for me to get the courage to actually talk, so that's how I go. Um, <laughs> uh, I am the youngest daughter of the youngest of the Ivan's nine, um, but before I tell any stories of my own, mine are very short and not as exciting. Um, my cousin Aaron, who is the uh, son of my Aunt Georgia, submitted a story through Facebook, and I thought it'd be kind of cool for him to get to be a part, because he's in Arizona right now, and he wasn't able to come here. So I'm gonna do my best attempt at reading off his story first. Um, and I s just lost my place, so just give me like 30 seconds. Okay. <clears throat> Um, Aaron's story is called uh, Mechanized Summer. You were an unlikely figure to enter my life at that time, but you did boldly enter for reasons that I can't and now won't ever be able to 100% discern. I think you wanted to make a difference. I think I amused you. I think you saw potential in me. I think once you did let me in that I continued to entertain. I think you wanted to show love and kindness to someone. I know for one short summer you chose me as your destination. I was full of missteps and loose words. There was that one morning when I was supposed to work but was dreadfully hungover. I woke up hours late. Strangely, I didn't recede quietly from this life challenge. I called and roused you at work and you agreed to let me engage in the day's work, albeit quite late. You had a patience, a thoughtfulness, a kindness that summer. I remember driving around with you to various jobs. We, hold, we mostly hauled machines in your well-worn pickup truck, the one you, didn't, you bought at an auction. Uh, you shared a warehouse space somewhere near the west side. I think of Milwaukee City or of Milwaukee Can County sponsored it. Your space wasn't large, but it seemed to house your mechanized behemoth as well. Uh, we hauled all manner of machines. Being skilled and a practiced carpenter, you had an especially keen eye for bandsaws, jigsaws, miter saws, and handheld nail guns. But your repertoire wasn't limited to this. You bought all, all manner of mechanical wonders. They generally were working, but your scheme was to acquire, to improve, and to sell at a handsome profit. You were good at this. I remember that I talked too much when we were driving around telling you much too frankly of my exploits and countercultural endeavors that had a partying boy of 19 was up to. You accepted these stories with that slight lilting laugh of yours. Excusing the excesses and accepting the storyteller in that one short sound. I still like to tell stories of Uncle Bob. Your work and knowledge brought, your <coughs> brought you great community in our humble city. You were connected to most everyone we'd meet, be it at the restaurant where we lunched, or at the warehouse where we hold your prizes. Most passerby called out your name with some cheery greeting attached. I don't remember anyone shir darkly shirking or skirting your presence. 
you had a way of drawing people in. You weren't a dressy man. You generally wore a flannel shirt and jeans when they saw you, and they weren't new. You had a raggedy cap to match, pushing back your wild red curls. This is how I remember you and your visage, wild and raggedy. Underneath that, though, was a calm and understanding, as if the world had shown you its underbelly and you were now just obligingly petting it. The most memorable errand we ran together was when we went to that closed down AMC plant on Capitol Drive. You remember? It was the biggest interior I'd ever been aside to, aside from County Stadium. But it was dusky and moody, and slanted depth of light broke through the small rectangular, sometimes broken panes of glass. We entered and advanced up on the large, endless avenues littered with dilapidated aging machines on either side. You had a map that led us to the machine you purchased. Uh, we loaded it onto a pallet we'd just brought along. The whole time I was explaining how cool and vastly industrial the space was. My favorite unkempt thought process processes were going wild with speculation of all the hard worker, the workers that had inhabited that space, and what I'd do with it, if that space, if I had it. I was excited. In reality, we just hauled the pallet jack out, loaded it and the purchase machine out of the back of pickup truck, and left. AMC doesn't exist anymore, and there are other pick and saves and other stores in a strip mall occupying that ma former manufacturing space. To this day, when I see it, all I see is that old AMC plant. My employment ended abruptly alone, when alone on my first exterior house painting job. I got scared of the ladder's second floor height, the buzzing sinister bees <laughs> that were routinely invading my space, and in general, the hot summer sun. I left the ladder in a locked garage, but never returned the key to you. We never talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the end of my cousin's story. Um, I didn't know my uncle as well as a majority of the people here. Um, being very young, as my mom put it, he didn't like me as much because I was very loud and impetuous and kind of annoying. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, um, I never really got to talk to him much, but I did have a couple stories. Um, when I was in college, I actually went to school here at Mayad, and I, for various trips, I would do photography around the city or use them for reference points and illustrations I was making. And creepily enough, almost everywhere I went in the city, there would be this auspicious sea green truck that would be <laughs> somewhere nearby wherever I was working and I always knew Uncle Bob was somewhere nearby I just didn't know where or why he was where I was at the time um, and then uh, another story that my Uncle Dick I think recited but I don't quite remember it super well um, he had apparently bought a whole bunch of old wood work tables um, just very lightly refinished them, like barely did any work on them, and he managed to sell them for like double the price that they were initially given to him. And I was really impressed by someone's business audacity to be able to like just push something out the door for double the price. Um, and the last story uh, that I can think of, um, I didn't get to talk to him much, but there was this rare time when I had worked on a written story of mine years ago, and he actually took the time to read this like 25 page story, and I was just totally floored that he took the time to do it. And he told me that he said my words were very heartfelt and personal, and it sounded as if I was speaking. And I only have five quotes that people have ever told me in my entire life, and that's one of the five that will never leave. So those are my stories. Okay, so, anyone else? Yes, okay, come on up, Jeff. This is so wonderful, and thank you all for, for staying. <laughs> well, in a lot of ways, I've been debating whether I should even come up and say what I'm gonna say. Not that it's inflammatory or anything like that. Um, but just that I want to make sure that it comes across correctly. 
and that I can formulate it in the way that everyone will understand it in the way that I mean it. Um, I really hardly knew Bob at all, with the, the exception of a couple of visits that he came out to Arizona, because um, that's where mainly where I grew up. Is, um, my father, John, is his oldest brother and had moved out to Arizona when I was five. So, but on the occasions that he did come out, we all loved to see him because he was always just, you know, bubbling over and, you know, had all kinds of crazy stories even then to tell. And uh, it, was, it was always fun to see him. And especially, you know, knowing that he's from this big extended family, you know, it was always great for us being out way out west, you know, to get some contact, you know, context and contact with the family. But, um, you know, what I see tonight validates what I'm going to say completely because, you know, it, it's been obvious for quite a while that we were going to come to this point. Um, probably sooner than later. I mean, you just read the handout that uh, has circulated on his, you know, nine lives. Um, and it's, it's, it's actually pretty amazing that he, that he made it to this point. Um, so I've been preparing emotionally and mentally for this time for quite a long while. Um, and uh, a couple of, this occurred to me a couple of years ago, actually. And uh, I just wanted to say, you know, um, I differ with him and most of my extended and most of my immediate family, philosophically, religiously, you know, almost completely. Um, I do not talk politics with my family. I don't talk religion with my family. Very good reasons for it. I'm going to say one thing about Bob, though, and that's, um, you know, of course he wasn't conventionally religious, and it should be obvious from what I've already said that I, tr I tend that way. And what I really wanted to say about Bob, and it shows in the faces and the stories of everyone here tonight, is that In spite of that, in spite of our differences and everything, with regard to the way that he influenced people in his life, in both the question of the volume of people that he influenced and the positive way that he influenced them, I've never seen a man live a more Christian life. That's, that's my commentary. I, I can comment more, much more on his character than I can about any of the events in his life, but that, that's a statement that I think I can make with complete assurance. So. Thanks, Jim. This is so exciting. <laughs> Thank you. Is anyone else? Fifty-three years, and he is a great person. He was always, what I remember about Bob, oh, and I can tell you one short story that I remember him telling me. When he was in the Army, he was stationed for a while out in Fort Huachuca, and then we visited him after he was in the Army. He came to our house and he said, he was telling me about how it was in the camp, in the desert, and he said, I learned the hard way that before I put my boots on in the morning, you shake them out. 
because of the skull, because of the scorpions, and he had one in his boot. And anyway, I remember that story. But always when you'd go to Bob's house or anywhere, he was always very welcoming, and um, Bob was always good to me. He would listen to me just as much as Joe. And like someone else said, if he came to your house and you made a meal, he would tell you, oh my God, this is fabulous, this is so good, you know, until you were the best cook. So he made you feel good, I mean, he, was, he was a good guy. And I'm glad that he had Barb, and I'm glad I know Barb, and, and I'm really sorry he's gone. Uh, I'm gonna miss Bob. I don't have one bad memory of Bob, only good memories. He was a good guy. Adrian, Adrian, do you want to say something? Um, I just always thought Robert was really cool. Uh, he was kind of like Indiana Jones, you know, um, like Indiana Jones who also liked craft work. Um, so. I just remember going to his home as kind of a teenager and finding out that he had this amazing record collection. And uh, I've known him all my life. Uh, I feel really lucky to, he came to my 40th birthday party in July and uh, I hadn't seen him in a while. And I got to see him a few, uh, a couple weeks ago. I'm really glad that he was in my life for so for as long as I can remember. He's kind of like, I guess, he's an uncle to some. He feels like an uncle or a grandfather to me. I mean, he's always been there. He was always at holidays. He was there for walks. And, um, I feel really lucky. And with that, I feel lucky to know all the people that I know through him. Harvey and Dot. And so many people here that, I don't know, are, are just like more family. So, uh, I thank my, my mom and Dale for surrounding us with just the most wonderful people. Uh, and all of you are here, so uh, I thank Robert too. Thank you, Barbara. Suzanne? Robert loved poetry, uh, as you could tell from Robert's, from Harvey's work. And Suzanne was, Suzanne is one of his favorite po poets as well. He would always come to all of the, um, the poetry readings at Woodland Pattern, etc. And so I invited Suzanne to join us tonight as well. And I used to have a text in one hand and the microphone in the other, but <laughs> I'll give it a shot. Is it? Okay, I sing of aging, man aging, as if things weren't bad enough. We all discover growing old is tough. What else can I say? We're slowly fading away. Matters that matter become immaterial as we realize that everything is ethereal, dissipating into the past. Nothing will last. So gather ye roses that open and wilt. Make rose petal tea and use skim milk to strengthen bones without raising cholesterol. Gulp down vitamins, try not to fall. Write down the facts you want to keep in mind. Get rid of cataracts so you won't grow blind. Gather ye roses for rose petal tea. Replace your hip, replace your knee. <laughs> Replace your replacement when it develops a glitch. 
Keep pace with your maker. Try not to bitch, for knowing death is on its way. You better say thanks for today. Say thanks, say thanks. You're not quite obsolescent. Say thanks, say thanks. Each day is a present. One more thing to keep in mind. Everything else is also in decline. Things aging. Without our acquiescence, we live with planned obsolescence. Rather than repair the old, it's cheaper to buy things new. Throw the outdated in the dump. It'll lie right next to you. VCR tapes fading. Camcorder needs upgrading. Toaster oven broken. Start microwaving. Dial telephone. Not worth saving. Patrollers for 78 cents. Stereos for 33 cents. CDs replaced LPs. What the hell are DVDs? <laughs> IBMs became PC. Ah, Macs became G3s and then G4 with more and more and more and more and more and more gigahertz, gigabytes. My spell check never heard of any giga, 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 won't replace my clothes or bike with each changing design, nor toss out each appliance with lemming-like compliance. If we replace possessions with every change of style, our legacy becomes a global garbage pile. Rum aging. I don't know if aging rum is good, but I approve of rummaging in the neighborhood. <laughs> Buying what I can secondhand turns rubbish into rummage. It's one small way to fight obsolescence planned. Earth aging. We're a tick on the stick on the yardstick of eternity. A jot, a dot, a spot, low by modernity, by the mad mode of modernization, by the foul fumes of accumulation. For the tip on the stick, the jot, the dot, the spot, consumes with no fear causing life to disappear. At least the earth itself will stay. So say thanks, say thanks for today. Say thanks, say thanks. You're not quite obsolescent. Say thanks, but say thanks. Each day is a present. Oh, life may disappear. The earth will stay. So, say thanks, say thanks for today. Thank you. That was amazing. Anyone else? Well, I'd just like to again thank everyone. Anyone? Oh, Gail, did you want to say something? Come right ahead. Dick still here? No, I just wanted to acknowledge him. I met Robert through Steve Lacey and Dick. I was 
until I met him a long time ago, 35 years ago. What's that? Oh, no, I'm sorry. <clears throat> so Dick is here, yeah. Because, Dick, I was acknowledging that I met Robert through you and Steve Lacey. That's correct. Because I was a budding woodworker. I didn't know shit. Lacey was experienced. I met him. I met you. I met you through Steve. And then he had that great assistant, Bruce. I don't remember what his last name was, but you know who I mean. Yeah, because he had plain design on Brady Street. So anyway, I met Robert a long time ago, and we hit it off right away. We had, you know, simple connection because we, <clears throat> there was all this woodworking stuff going on, and he became my helper, actually, where I just paid him by the hour to help me doing these wacky jobs that Lacey would help me out with. And then my primary mentor has been my friend Charlie, who just hugged my son Adam right there. <laughs> Charlie and I went to high school together, but he's a truly skilled woodworker and has been my teacher, functionally. So Robert was my helper. And then one way or the other, do you remember how he ended up doing the used machinery thing? The way, that, the way that happened was, I was also trying to start a woodworking business, which I did do, and I started by buying what I could afford, and with, through lack of experience, I bought a bunch of junk. <laughs> and I figured it didn't work out. And so what I said, I should give you the way. No, but that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> it was, it was, uh, we all buy, way, we all buy cheap shit at first, right? Right. That's how we have to. Right. It was just, uh, people of like minds. Right on. My brother Bob, he did not have the, uh, he didn't have the self-discipline of a craftsman. And that's not a knock against him. No. He was a freewheeling guy. He, like, he had to have a lot of freedom. And he didn't want to mess around. Making quotations, meeting uh, customers' demands, and all of that—that that, that just that wasn't going to happen. I don't want to either. I don't want to either. I've sort of dealt with it over the years. So anyway, he was my helper for a long time, but then he started a machinery business, and that turned into a whole thing. And um, that youngster in the background there, uh, you know, understands how that all went, but. Anyway, so Robert, when my kids were young, my kids are all here, and he would be around every morning, and, you know, and our landlord and friend who lived upstairs on Bremen Street, where I had a complete, like, shop in the basement with all kinds of large machines and a phase converter that I made myself, and whatever. <laughs> he would show up every day because he really liked having breakfast with us, so. <laughs> He totally supported me being a self-employed person. And then Michael Oblitz was brought up, and I really wish I, I really wish Karen Lupo was here because she was married to Michael Oblitz and he did some of the original funding for me to be a self-employed person and whatever. So one thing led to another and we all, you know, survived intact and Robert was part of all of that. Like he was really in the middle of it. And so I recently, like two weeks ago actually, had the opportunity to do a, an experience using ayahuasca and I had a really lovely, lovely encounter with him two nights before he died where we had really intimate communication and it was fantastic. So. I got to wish him. I got to wish him well and thank him for the contributions that he made to 
not only by family, but a lot of other people. So here's to Robert. Here's to Robert, honestly. He was a really good guy. So thank you. Do you want to say anything? I would like to say a little bit about Emir. Sure. Um, Emir um, has made a video of Robert um, at his auctions, and maybe you can tell a little bit more about what that was like. Hello. Uh, so I, I met Robert around uh, 10 years ago, so through Sarah, and Sarah's uh, husband. And I had a chance to make a documentary about him. I went to auction with him in 2013 or 14. And he was an amazing guy. I think he's my best friend here in the United States. So he came to my uh, citizenship ceremony. He was the only person there. My car broke down. This Green Bay Packers Super, Super Bowl game. Like he came in a fix. He little bit mumbled, but he, he did the job, he, he helped me. And he was the only person, I guess, understand my sense of humor. And he was laughing my jokes. I don't know if... And also he had some difficulties to understand my accent, so... I think he was understanding me like 50% most of the time. <laughs> but he was still laughing at me. I don't know, he was an amazing guy. Yeah, it's, it's such a privilege to know him. Thanks. Is there anyone else? Well, I would just like to thank all of you once again for joining with us tonight. It's been so special to meet some of the people that I never did know and to hear some of these stories. If any of you would like to know more about Robert's many lives, I had the pleasure of writing about it and there's some copies on the table over there and if you didn't have a chance to sign your name we forgot to bring a book for you but if you could just sign your name so i know you were here that would be wonderful thank you again i'm sending you all a big hug thank you